Okay, that's supposed to be my like screensaver slide before I get started. Um, if you don't know what that is, that's a dog. Um, Shiba Inu. The meme is called Doge. It says things like "Wow X" and "Amaze Y." And this is the world that I live in. Uh, I live in a world where our job is to make fun of the world that we live in. Uh, we take this very seriously, actually, um, because we think that humor, uh, as a method of communication, especially on social media, has become more and more powerful and more and more integral to the identity of the millennial generation. And so our our, our growth has been driven by that. And in the last seven years uh, of running this company, I've actually gotten to learn quite a bit about this thing called media. Uh, I graduated from uh, Medill School of Journalism, um, and I didn't go into journalism. I actually left to do this dot-com thing back in 2000 when my friends were like, that's a fad. Um, and it turned out to be a fad. I lost my job. I wandered the world for a little bit. And uh, I ended up in Seattle where I started this company by getting a bunch of money from investors to go buy a cat picture website. <laughs> True story. Um, it's all documented online. I know you guys are laughing, but it's actually a true story. And now I've got a bunch of websites like this that I help run. And, and my job is to kind of see where the world is headed in, in terms of media. And so three years ago, um, I, I ran into a guy named Matt Galligan, who is now the CEO of Circa. And the idea was that we think journalism uh, has been just porting itself from print to online. And no real change or disruption has occurred since then. Now that we're moving once again from the web to mobile, there has to be a change because it's really hard to read news on a mobile device. And so Matt and I um, started this company together with our third co-founder, uh, Arsenio Santos. And Circa has been evolving under his hands. And it's been going through a phenomenal uh, change and really changing the way people think about how mobile news should be consumed. So I'm here to talk about the product formerly known as content. Right? Like, so I use the word product deliberately here because I feel like it's really important to understand that the service and the newsprint and the stories and the things that we find beautiful about the craftsmanship of news and storytelling has to be wrapped in a product because that is the world that we live in today. Because unfortunately, it used to be that there were subscriptions that were product, but today, like uh, uh, the intro, you guys can download, just download Circa, and we've just infinitely increased distribution from here on out without any resources. And that product, that software product, that experience of consuming the news sometimes matters more than the news itself. So um, it starts with this guy. Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. And what I've done to adapt this is that while he was you know, living in the 50s and 60s where TV was coming into vogue, we live in a world where the medium is very much infinitely changeable from device to device. It's very malleable. What I'm really here to say is the format is the message, and the format lives inside the computer. And you, know, you don't have to break open your phone to see this. I will, I will walk you through how to look inside your phone. So let's talk about these devices, OK? So these devices control how we actually interact with content. So what are these devices? Well, so you're, you've got an iPhone here, for example. Um, the format that lives inside the iPhone is controlled by the form factor of the device. In other words, the device that you're using, it's a tablet. Then the content that you'll be consuming has to be native to that tablet. If you're using a phone, that 16 by 9 ratio screen actually dictates the type of content that you're willing to interact with. What's happened in the past is that we had verticalized formats. In other words, if you wanted to read something, you had a set of devices that you could use to read. If you wanted to watch videos, there's a set of things that you could use to actually watch video. And none of them really crossed over into each other. But in today, verticalization has turned into horizontalization. Uh, horizontalization. Everything can do everything. So it becomes a matter of user choice. It is not restriction because the device doesn't allow you to do so. It is a restriction based on what do I feel like is the right device for the thing that I'm doing today. So if you're on an airplane, the only thing you have is your iPhone. And that's the only way you can watch videos on it. You will use your iPhone. But if you're on an airplane and you've got an iPad, and an iPhone, you will use your iPad because the form factor lends itself better to the activity that you're using. And therefore, that product experience changes depending on the device that you use. So we use all these devices now to communicate with one another. We are creating content that is uh, great for portable uh, a distribution that is short form, like Instagram and tweets and things like that. What is that content? What does it mean for us? Well, human beings actually use all these devices. But at the end, what we use them for is that we create content to build relationships. Unlike the real world where I can go out and shake your hand and get to know you, the only way for me to get to know you online is through the content that you post. Okay? So all these relationships out there that are being created, this is a map of Facebook's uh, network uh, visualized, is that every single one of those bright lines crossing the planet is a piece of content that tells you something about the person 
who liked it, shared it, posted it. Content the product is not about inf being informed, although that is still part of the big part of the process today. But content today is much more about the product of who I am and how I want to express myself. And that challenge actually is becoming more and more interesting because the world of media is becoming more fragmented. So you have here a prediction of the hours per week of, of media consumption across the globe uh, according to a study. Now you see that we're over here now and it's quite fragmented compared to 50 years ago. And what we're seeing is that not only is the main dominant analog television market shrinking and replacing with digital, but also a lot of new opportunities have, uh, have shown up since the 1980s. If you see this graph going up and to the right, you'll notice that there's only 112 hours um, available to you as a human being in any given week when you are awake, if you sleep eight hours a week, I mean eight, eight hours a day, right, eight hours a week. Some of you probably sleep eight hours a week. Okay, I don't. So I like my sleep. So that means that by 2036, I had to like take out a ruler and just measure it really carefully. 2036, we're going to reach a point in which you are staring at media 24-7, practically, minus sleep. Every single moment of your life, you'll be staring at some sort, of, some sort of media. And most of it will be digital. Is that possible? Yeah, because you're staring at it right now. right? Some of you actually have two things open. Like you have your laptop and your phone, and you're staring at this. And how do you even count that? I don't have that many fingers on my hand, right? Like, it's crazy, but what we're doing is walking down the street, checking our email, listening to music, and not getting hit by a car. We are doing this because for some reason, we are starting to fill more and more and more of our lives with media. And it's incredibly powerful opportunity for people like us because we see both the market increase and the fragmentation as opportunities. You guys remember what, hap what you used to do in a coffee shop before smartphones? Like, hi, I'm waiting for coffee. What did you do? Like, stare at the back of people's heads? Right? Like, we now look at our phones and read news and play games and talk to each other. But before then, we just did this. Right? We're filling our gap time with media, and what happens is that in that short amount of time, this is your competition. In a fragment of moment where you have to spend figuring out what you should consume, the lowest common denominator is the pet photo. And I mean this kind of jokingly, but the fact of the matter is we've produced an amazingly large like, uh, a chorus of cat photos and dog photos, and it's no surprise that we find that we like these things because for the last 10,000 years, we've been breeding these animals so that they're cuter and cuter. And so when you take a decent photo of a cat or a kitten, you're like, oh, that's cute. I don't understand why I think, I think it's so cute. We've been breeding them to like them. And then we post them on the internet and go, oh. And so the bar for content has been rising because of this. And I know it sounds completely ridiculous at times, but if you had a choice between this and a really terrible ad, which dominates the internet, what are you going to choose? Right? This is the competition for content. And what happened with attention is that we, complain, we always complain about how little attention there is, how little there is for us to actually spend mentally to consume knowledge and subject matter. Well, I don't find that to be really true. We, attention isn't really going away. It used to be that attention was like this. You needed to like, starve for three days before you could like, eat this much pizza. Right? You had to like, ready yourself for content that was heavy, deep, and thoughtful. The world's moved on to more of a thin crust model where you're just snacking all the time. Yes, attention is available. Yes, attention is grabbable. But the size of attention that you will grab relative to the past is much smaller. Because everybody out there is consuming media in little bite-sized pieces. It's not that there isn't room for a lot of attention. But the market of attention has actually followed the, the, uh, the power curve, which is very few in-depth articles are consumed by people. But in the long tail, lots of tiny little pieces of content are consumed by human beings. The total pie of attention has grown. It's just that it doesn't feel that way when you're losing market share. So how do you find solutions in a world that's fragmented, that has all these devices, and it's really hard to tell what people are doing on what? For our answer at Cheeseburger is to embrace the idea of short form. And to embrace the idea of short form, we have to go for the emotional impact. Humor has a lot of dependency on how we feel rather than the cerebral aspect. Same thing with Circa. Um, but in fact, Circa hasn't gone on the emotional side. It's gone short form, but on the 
control side. As a user, how do you control what you can actually read and what actually you be informed by? Circa's um, revolutionary uh, concept is the atomization of content. That the idea is that you can take a news article or news event, and you don't have to publish articles back to back to back and update just the lead. Start giving people what they need at the time of the need. So what happens is that. Uh, something really big happens, and all of a sudden, uh, you'll go to like a, a CNN or NBC News, and they'll say, something really big and terrible happened. Come back later. We know nothing. <laughs> That's like saying, hey, guys, welcome to the Apple store. Um, we, we know that you want the iPhone, but everybody, oh, wait, that, they do that. OK. That's a bad example. Um, <laughs> it's like going to McDonald's and saying, hey, I know that you're here for the Egg McMuffin, but come back in 45 minutes when we have more. right? So what happens is we're chasing customers out the door. We're kicking them out, saying, great news. We'll have more soon. With Circa, because it's atomized, somebody can actually follow that specific news story. So um, Ferguson uh, riots are happening. Follow the story for any updates. What happens is at the moment of, big, of the greatest demand for news, what Circa is saying is, we'll tell you when the next thing happens. And that follow model has really changed the way editors think about their readers. In fact, your um, uh, biggest data point for uh, what is in demand is the page view. Right? That's how we all kind of live our lives, is how many page views did that story get? Um, the reason page views are so important is because advertising models are actually wedded to the idea of page views. The more pages you have, the more ads you show, the more ads you show, the more, moment, more money you make, and so on. But page views are incredibly highly determined by the headline it's written, when it was posted, what social network it took it off on. And so it has really nothing to do with the story. In fact, we found very little correlation between high page views and long-term viewership. So what we did was we looked at follows and say, what are we doing that lets the user tell us that they're interested in, in having a relationship with us? And that follow button, like if you follow a story, we know that at some point that is a vote for us to do more research in that story. And it turned out, uh, to our surprise, um, science and technology stories, uh, hard science and like space and technology stories had incredible large amounts of followership per story. And so we ended up hiring a technology editor. And so that data to us is something that didn't exist before, and we're leveraging it to actually control and decide our editorial decision making. So neither of these platforms, Cheeseburger nor Circa, are about summaries. Okay, that's one of the mistakes that I see all the time, that for some reason, because the product is smaller right, in footprint, it's a website with a bunch of pictures, it's a news story with a bunch of smaller paragraphs, that, that, that people assume that they're summaries. If you've been following the Syrian war story on Circa from day one, you have read more than 5,000 words. 5,000 words. Now, that's an incredibly long story that's been going on for two years, but that's the power of being letting your users choose the type of interaction that they want with the media organization. And so here's a picture on the other side. Um, so if Circa is providing lots of knowledge in small form, bite-sized format, here's what we do on Cheeseburger to grab the emotion. This is a dog waiting for its owner to come back to his house during Katrina. Super sad. We had a lot of debate about this uh, photo um, on Cheeseburger because we're supposed to be a happy website. We're supposed to be a site where you can go to laugh and to escape the moment. And to post something like this makes the reality crash in on a happy moment. But one of the things that we realized was that if you continue to try to make somebody laugh over and over again, it gets really tiring. In fact, one of the worst people to actually have dinner with is a comedian who's on performance because you just want to have a conversation with them. What's really important here in being a humor website is that we had to provide variety. That humor itself and laughter wasn't just about one piece of funny content, that it was a chorus of different, sorry, corpus of different types of humor that lets you understand the emotional ups and downs of entertainment. And so both these things we had to build into our technology and our format how the users browse our sites, how the users actually follow a story, what happens to the update. All of that stuff was just as important, if not more, than the content we posted itself. In fact, more errors can be made on content than on the product. The product had a smaller margin for error. So what happens to old formats? Right? What happens to formats of the past? How many of you here have used a scroll recently? <laughs> OK, we have one person who's not lying. Let me tell you why you guys are all lying. That's a receipt. That's a scroll. 
Old formats do not die. Evolution of media says they continue to get more and more and more specialized. They never quite go away. In fact, vinyl record sales have gone up 700% in the last three years on Amazon.com. Vinyl, the worst possible way to listen to music. Actually, it's one of my favorites. I own vinyl. I love it. But it's not for the same reasons that we did back in the 1950s. People listen to vinyl because of a qualitative difference in the audio, something that people didn't appreciate when they were trying to make vinyl this big so you can carry it around your house. right? Turning vinyl into MP3 players didn't work. But vinyl, to its advantage, had a very few handful of things it did really well, and people appreciate them for that. Same thing with the scroll. Scrolls are great for printing undetermined lengths of content in small pieces. And so I don't know what's going to happen with the newsprint or the magazine, but evolution of media has shown us over and over again that we continue to find and adapt and find new ways to do this, that new ways to actually use media. And now in the future, the definition of media as a product continues to change. So we have things like, this is a MakerBot uh, Replicator 2, which allows you to download a 3D object file from space and stick it into a USB port, and boom, there it is, a tractor. Now, how is, me how is this media? Right? It's a physical object. Well, maybe it's possible that uh, distributed with your uh, magazine is a file that allows you to make a little uh, stand that lets you microwave bacon. Right? Now, it's a real object, but the distribution mechanism is the same thing as media. Buy this newspaper, get the Baconator for free. It, what we're doing right now is that because of the digitization of the world around us, we are redefining the way uh, of what media is, how it's formed, how it's distributed, and how people will perceive it. And if you want to get ahead of the curve, we've got to start thinking about this, that you've got to break down the definition barriers of what you were told was media, and needs to start thinking about how can we leverage media for something in the future. And, and part of that process is telling stories. So this guy from up, I forgot his name. Anyone? Mr. Fredrickson. Mr. Fredrickson, thank you. Lovely, adorable man. We used to tell stories like him. Once upon a time, beginning, middle, and end. And by the time middle got around, you fell asleep. Okay. Part of the storytelling of today is that we don't tell stories like Mr. Uh, Fredrickson. We tell stories based on the assumption of context, based on the idea that you already know what I'm talking about. Still a better love story than Twilight. <laughs> I just told you everything I needed to tell you about this joke without having to tell you any of the context. I'm assuming you know what Twilight is. Two, that people love to hate on Twilight. And three, there's a movie in Tom Hanks had a love affair with a volleyball. Those three things that I knew that you knew allowed me to tell the story in one image with just one line of uh, a caption on it. And we've actually continued to adapt this format of storytelling from history. In fact, this isn't brand new. Here's another example. Father, yes, my son, I miss you. <laughs> now, I actually broke these images apart in three pieces because uh, it used to look like this. In the 1400s, they called this a triptych. We continue to find new ways of reusing old formats into new digital forms, and we create new products out of that. And what we do is we evolve, but the evolution of media is not what you were expecting. Uh, there's a real myth about evolution that it's survival of the fittest. That's not true. It's survival of whatever the hell works right now. <laughs> That's evolution. It doesn't get better, right, stronger. It fits the market and the environment that it needs to thrive in. And so when people look at Circa and say, that's just a summary, I point them at this and say, sure it is. This is how evolution occurs. We are trying to find a market and product fit for, for information. And in order to do that, we've got to stop thinking about all the things we can't do. The magic trick here of, of Circa and Cheeseburger is that we are able to do something and deliver something in a way, in a format that people said was impossible because people kept on thinking about how terrible and constraining those things were. But to me, those constraints, the moment you embrace those constraints is when you start to get really creative. Because when creativity does not come from the absence of constraint, you, any, you ask any artist, give them a blank canvas and say, paint something amazing, they can't. Con uh, creativity is really the idea that it's the catalyst that frees us from our own mental traps. That that constraint is the thing that you want to overcome and allows you to be creative about it. And what we're saying by doing this, by telling stories in a way 
um, that's about the shared context that we have. What we're doing by creating a new triptych uh, with digital media in a vertical format is, if you understand this, you understand me. You get who I am. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you very much.